no hearings. That means the Senate Intelligence Committee was not permitted to hold hearings or review intelligence and take action and alert the American people about what was going on in China. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee turned that committee into a political witch hunt operation in which they tried to remove the President of the United States from August all the way through until February. How many hearings did Adam Schiff hold on China? How many hearings did he hold on the outbreak of the virus? No, he even became the lead manager of the impeachment trial effort in the United States Senate. Nancy Pelosi slowed that e effort down by an entire month. Chuck Schumer was banging the pots and pans, demanding more and more witnesses. And now today they say, that has nothing to do with anything. It has everything to do with everything. This is one pandemic. There can be other pandemics, for instance, and I want to discuss this some with the senator. The electromagnetic pulse, EMP. We talk about this every year. This is serious business where an enemy or even the sun can shut down our entire electrical grid. And if people think this is bad, imagine no electricity, no food, no sewer systems. Imagine the entire society shutting down. We just spent $2.2 trillion. And now they're talking about another $2 trillion to build roads and bridges, which you're not even allowed to use right now. While the governors are shutting down part of the economy, we have massive liquidity going on here. I don't know what for. So some jobs apparently are essential if the government subsidizes them, but apparently not if they're in the private sector. I have real issues with this. But this electromagnetic pulse, trillions and trillions of dollars being spent, this costs two to three billion dollars to protect our electrical grid, and nobody's doing anything effective about it. So I wanted to lay those markers out there. I want to introduce you to a great senator, Tom Cotton. By the way, Tom Cotton, you were the first senator, really the first person that I know of, to be waving the flag, say, hey, China, hey, this virus, hey, this is a big issue. You even did this before the medical uh, experts, the scientific experts in this country were waving the flag. January 22nd, you sent a letter to the secretary of HHS, and you warned him about this problem Sorry, and said he needed to look into it. On January 26th, Dr. Fauci, who I have great respect for, in a podcast interview said that this virus probably will be something like a bad flu that the public doesn't need to worry. Well, obviously, we're very, very worried now. Senator Cotton, best-selling New York Times author, Sacred Duty. Here's my question to you, sir. How did you know so early, really before almost any other public figure, that we were in for a problem with respect to China? Mark, thanks for having me on again. Uh, I knew early on, probably the second weekend of January, um, that something was happening in central China, just looking at the publicly available sources from China and East Asia. And then by that third weekend, by the first weekend of the impeachment trial, it was clear to me that action was called for. And I'm not a scientist or a doctor, I'm not an expert in epidemiology, but I do have common sense and two eyes, and I could see the contrast between two things from Beijing. On the one hand, the lies of the Chinese Communist Party, telling the world that they have things under control, that this virus probably couldn't be transmitted between humans, that it would be nothing more than a bad flu. And on the other hand, the extreme drastic measures they had taken, like closing schools nationwide, or literally welding the doors shut on high-rise apartments in Wuhan, or Hong Kong shutting down air travel from the mainland, the contrast between Beijing's words on one hand and their actions on the other hand told me from the very beginning that this virus was much more dangerous, much more contagious than Beijing was letting on, and that it was time to start ringing the alarm here in the United States and around the world. When you began ringing the alarm here in the United States, were many of your colleagues in Congress paying attention? Um, that's a serious question because I don't remember many of them paying attention at all. Mark, unfortunately, when I began to ring that alarm in January, the Senate was paralyzed with the partisan impeachment trial of the president. We literally could not get on the Senate floor to give a speech. So I think the first public remarks I gave about this virus was in the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, hearing late in January on, on an unrelated topic. Now, I did have many private conversations with Republican senators who had seen some headlines uh, but hadn't really dove deep into the issue. 
once I spoke with them, many of them began to share my concerns. Some of them spoke to the administration as well to support my efforts to get the president to ground travel from China in late January, as he thankfully did. But there's no doubt that the partisan impeachment trial that paralyzed the Senate for three weeks impeded the early efforts to sound the alarm for the American people out of the Senate. You know, Senator, I've been tracking as carefully as I can because I'm a public voice, so I need to do these things. Uh, the scholarship on this virus, the various models that are publicly available, I've been listening to Dr. Uh, uh, Fauci and uh, Dr. Burks. And I have to say, I'm getting a little bit of whiplash here. Um, the data changes, and so the model changes, and so the analyses change, and so forth and so on. But one of the things that concerns me is this constant use of China's data. They're lying. They cover this up. Their figures make no sense. It's a massive country, and they pretend they had a few thousand deaths. And don't we know from intelligence services today that that's simply not true? So why are we modeling or others modeling based on China's data figures? Smart. So first off, there's no doubt that China is still lying. Just as we saw in January, their words and their actions don't match. That's still the case today. China claims that they have this virus totally un under control. Just last weekend, they shut down all movie theaters once again, just a week after having opened them up. A country that has a pandemic under control doesn't shut down all of its movie theaters nationwide. Or just look at Wuhan, where a single mortuary, a single mortuary ordered more urns than the Chinese Communist Party admit have died nationwide. The words simply do not match up to the facts that we can see. That's one reason why Dr. Burks said last week that the data coming out of China caused much of the world to underreact and be less prepared than we might have been because the data they presented simply does not comport with the reality that we now see in places like Italy and Spain and unfortunately in New York City because that's where the rubber meets the road. You know, there are a lot of unknowns about this virus in terms of when it becomes infectious, how long it remains infectious while asymptomatic, what the mortality rate ultimately will be. But here's the bottom line. They don't have to deploy the mercy and the comfort. They don't have to build, hospital, build hospitals in Central Park or the Javits Center for the seasonal flu. That tells us all we need to know about just how lethal this pandemic is and that China is responsible for unleashing it on the world. I'm just concerned, Senator, about some of our institutions. Congress, in my view, you don't have to agree with me, failed us. They were so obsessed with taking out the President of the United States. The Intelligence Committees and other relevant committees really were not doing their jobs, particularly in the House of Representatives. Uh, the initial reaction, quite frankly, from our experts at the CDC and the others was, uh, was not as robust as it could have been. And now I want to ask you about the media. When you first started to raise these issues about China, mid-January and so forth, tell me, were CNN and MSNBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, CBS, were any of them beating down your door to try and figure out why you were so uh, concerned about what was going on in China? You know, Mark, and on the contrary, most of those mainstream media sources were spouting Chinese Communist Party propaganda. In fact, some of them, like the Washington Post and the New York Times, actually run official Chinese Communist propaganda in their pages for massive fees. If anything, the mainstream media was more sensitive to offending the delegate sensibilities of Chairman Xi and his Communist Party apparatchiks by pointing out that this virus in fact originated in Wuhan and that China was responsible through their deceit and their corruption for unleashing it on the world. Let me ask you a question, just because, you know, you're a senator, you have to be involved in decision making, not that you're an expert on this illness, very few people are since we've never heard of it before. I'm just trying to figure out the logic of some of this. We shut down significant parts of the economy. By the way, the president hasn't shut it down. Governors do, mayors do, they, they are the decision makers and so forth. And then, uh, two questions to you. Number one, uh, then at some point we're going to open it up. If everybody, or pretty much, except for so-called essential human beings, are staying home, they don't get the virus, they don't become immune to the virus, and then at some given date, slowly or quickly, people are allowed to uh, socialize again and they go public again. 
I don't quite understand how we're gonna prevent the virus from not kicking in again when we have people who've never had the virus in touch with people who have had the virus. And therefore, it seems to me, we're gonna be going through something like this again, potentially. Where am I wrong on that? I'm just trying to think this through. Now, Mark, that's a real risk of a resurgence of the virus. Hong Kong and Singapore were some of the world leaders in getting it under control. Now, of course, those are uh, more like cities than a continental nation like ours, but they've unfortunately had a second wave of the virus hit. So when we do get the economy up and moving again, when we get people back on our feet, it's going to be after we have protected our hospitals and our healthcare system so we don't have the kind of scenes you see in Italy all around the country of people dying from overwhelmed hospitals, not just from coronavirus, but heart attacks or strokes or the other reasons people go to the hospital and need intensive care. There needs to be widespread and rapid testing, almost like, say, a home pregnancy test. Um, so people know if they have the virus, antibody testing will be an important part as well. So people know if they have had the virus, because right now, Dr. Fauci has said that the best working assumption is that people will be immune from this virus, at least the strain, once they have had it. That will all have to be integrated into the workplace. Workplaces will have to make sure that they are screening their employees, they're taking temperature as they do in South Korean workplaces today, and that we have active and um, aggressive measures to quarantine individuals with the virus and then trace the contacts they've had in recent times. Once we have had the time to build up those kind of capabilities, those kinds of skills at the state and local level, what you see in South Korea, then we can begin to get the economy back on its feet and get people back to working and we can move away from where we are now with population-based measures where we essentially tell everyone it's best to stay home if you can and move into individual case-based measures. That'll be the uh, kind of standard working model until we have effective therapeutic drugs that can suppress the symptoms of the virus and then ultimately a vaccine that can help us control its outbreak in the future. I have a second question for you, as I said, when we come back related to our economic decisions, if they make much sense. And we'll be right back with Senator Tom Cotton.